Okay, this month we are going to take a quick look at the Boost String Algorithms Library, uh, which is a collection of header files. It's a header-only library. Uh, you can find the documentation on Boost's website. Now the documentation, I'll be honest, it's a little sparse. Uh, could use more examples. Um, there are many variations of the different algorithms that are provided and they are shown in these headers like for instance here's the find header and you can see here's all these variations of the find algorithm and although this documentation serves as a useful reference it's not uh, like I said it's not that great for a user guide there in this usage section there are some examples um, there are some subtleties to these algorithms that are not obvious until you drill into the header files and because the header files are decorated with a lot of uh, what would become or be what would be replaced by concepts in C++20, the te their, their template oriented algorithms so there's a lot of machinery around the declarations to say, you know, this template applies when the template argument fills this variety of conditions versus another set of conditions. So another resource to use to find out about these libraries with more examples, uh, if you go to the website, theboostcpplibraries.com, this is a complete free book that's available online. You can uh, get a PDF for free or an ebook for free. Uh, you can purchase a copy if, uh, for Kindle if you want. But he has a, uh, this is by, make sure I get the author's name correctly, uh, by Boris Schaling. Um, he's been uh, updating this book for a while. So current copyright on this uh, electronic edition is 2023 so it's up to date but he has chapter on string algorithms and shows uh, some a lot more examples uh, so that's another reference to use um, we will look at some example code that I have created for this talk but first um, let's go and uh, take note of some of the concepts used in this library so there is the concept of uh, a finder and a formatter, these are both uh, concepts that are used to, as models for template arguments. So you can see down here in this concepts section, they have a, the finder concept and the formatter concept. So what is the idea of these? The finder is a generalized uh, predicate. So you can think of it as uh, a lambda or uh, some other kind of predicate function that you are supplying to identify when you're iterating over a range of characters in a string whether or not the current position satisfies some condition. The formatter is used for uh, replace operations to take an input range that is matched according to the finder and supply text to replace the input range according to the formatter. So uh, the string replace algorithms, which we are going to, we will see some usage uh, usages of the finder and formatter concepts in the sample code that we're going to look at. Um, but the details are in these descriptions of these individual headers. If you just want to include a single header and get all of the algorithms, you include boost algorithm string HPPP that just acts as an umbrella that includes all the other headers for the uh, uh, string set of string algorithms in the algorithm library. Now, even though the documentation here refers to this as the boost string algorithms library, this library the string algorithms have been folded into the large, more larger in general boost algorithms library. So let's go over and take a look at Visual Studio here. 
when I am obtaining the string algorithms through VC package, you just specify boost algorithm. That gives you all the algorithms of which the string algorithms are a subset. So if we browse over to our build directory to where VC package puts the header files, we see here's boost and here's algorithm subdirectory and inside here is a string.hppp that includes all the string algorithms. The string subdirectory contains the headers for uh, the individual clumps of algorithms. So for instance if we look at the find HPP these are all the find algorithms. They have pretty good Doxygen documentation at the top of each uh, declaration. They're all template functions so they're all declared and defined in the header. However you can see what I mean that um, you have you know various you know preprocessor macros getting involved here um, you've got you know these kinds of things these uh, boost uh, macros in here that make the code more portable but it does mean that like just trying to drill into it through your IDE with F12 uh, and you find also that this code you know it, the function that you're calling depends on a bunch of other functions and there's heavy uses of uh, boost range um, through this library which is why when we include the algorithm library for boost we get a bunch of other stuff too now that comes along for the ride the minimum this is the minimal set of extra stuff and including all these top level headers this is a minimal set of extra stuff that you need in order to use the boost algorithm library and that's the advantage of just obtaining this via VC package all those dependencies are downloaded for you and installed in your build tree and everything works out just fine so you don't have to worry about which pieces of boost do I need do I need all of it do I have to build it and so on but VC package takes care of all that so that makes it easy to consume now um, I've made a uh, this code is up on github and I'll be uh, adding a link to the video or a link to the github repo in the video description when I upload it to YouTube but um, I have made it a, uh, a CMake preset that references the VC package toolchain file that's down in the VC package submodule. I used uh, git submodule functionality to get VC package at a particular revision in my tree. So when you check out this tree and you do git init submodule and then git submodule update to get the submodule contents and then invoke CMake with this dash dash preset default it will supply the toolchain file it will make the build directory outside of your source tree literally outside as a peer so you end up with a directory structure where you've got the repository that you've checked out and then you've got the build directory side by side with that so that's just your basic setup now what I've done in here for our little example is literally 30 years ago I wrote a Perl script to intelligently fold build logs from make at the time I was doing a lot of building on Linux well it wasn't Linux it was Unix technically it was MIPS RISC OS but that's neither here nor there it was a Unix flavor and when you uh, did a make back in those days you didn't get anything like ninja where it just good gave you a summarized status it gave you the full compiler command on your output and uh, the way the compiler commands are generated they have lots of extra white space in the middle and they're very long lines and it's very hard to read so I read a little Perl script that would uh, fold text lines uh, breaking at white space and if it can't find appropriate white space then it'll find a non-alphabetic to break at it will replace repeated white space so space or tab characters it'll it'll take um, 
chunks of those characters and squish them into a single space. It'll take multiple blank lines and squish them to a single blank line. And when long lines are folded, they're uh, folded in such a way that they're indented, that the folded lines are indented. So you can see which lines were folded and which lines were just as wide as your terminal screen, terminal window. So this is handy script. I've been using it for, like I said, 30 years for at, at various times. And it does a lot of string manipulation. So I thought we would try and recreate that in C++. So I uh, am doing, I tried doing this test driven development. So I have a library that has all my source code in it. Um, I have a test project using gtest test cases that test the individual things. And I have a, a, a tool that drives the algorithms from the command line. So what's interesting here is the main for my tool literally does nothing but delegate off to a function. And that is so that I can test some functionality around that implementation of main. You see I'm passing in std c error here as an argument to my uh, main function. And that's so that I can, in testing, I can pass in a string stream instead of c error. And I can capture the output that would have been sent to that stream and validate its contents. So we'll go kind of top down. We'll take a look at my tests. Um, now, I need to make care star argv arrays, and they're kind of painful to create manually. I didn't want to allocate raw character pointers. So I just wrote a little function that takes a vector of std strings and gives me back a vector of care stars that I can use as my argv. And just to validate that this, oops, didn't mean to drag that source code. Uh, just to make sure that this code was functioning correctly, I wrote a little test for it. You know, I give it three std strings, and each of the care pointers that I get back should be equal to the strings in the input vector. Uh, so that's just a little helper that I'm using in my test code here. Um, here is a raw string literal that is my usage message. And my little tool here, it takes a command, an optional input file, and if you give an input file, an optional output file, the commands are two lower, two upper, and break line. Two lower and two upper are just a way to showcase the uh, string conversion algorithms in boost string algorithms. And uh, break line is the one that you know, has some real meat in it. We'll take a look at that. That's the re-implementation of that Perl script. It's not a literal translation. It's driven by the tests that I've written for that little piece of functionality. Uh, I got some unit tests here around arguments, you know, too, too few, too many, uh, unknown commands as the second argument. Um, and I've got if we take a look at the header file for this part of my little library, you see I've got my main declaration. And then I've also got this uh, thing that's a declaration of a, a function, a callable, a std function, that takes an, an O stream reference, a, a reference to a constant string, and returns a bool. And that's my thing that transforms lines. And it, this basically is the model for my thing that does two upper, my thing that does two lower, and my thing that breaks lines into, into uh, smaller lines. Uh, and I've got this driver function that takes this transformer and then an, and an input stream and transforms all the lines and sends them to the output stream. So. Since I am referencing I streams and O streams here, these are the base classes of file streams and string streams. So I can unit test that by using string streams in my test. And then in my uh, main driver code, it will use file streams if those arguments are provided. So back to the tests. Um, I've got code around that line transformer. Um, this is 
if we take a look at this, this is kind of a nice little feature from GMock from Google Test. You can mock a std function by instantiating this mock function template with the type of your std function. I've wrapped that in a strict mock so that any um, method calls that don't match my expectations cause a unit test failure and any missing method calls compared to what I configured also causes a failure. So it, it's a strict mock. It needs to have exactly the calls that's listed in each test case, no fewer and no more. And you can um, configure calls on your mocked function. I'm using this uh, underscore because there isn't a good way to match a iStream reference or an OStream reference. So I'm just using underscore, which is the wildcard matcher. But I'm, I am saying that the string argument should be uh, match. There should be a, a single call that matches the string argument whose value is the string one and the string two. Uh, and I've got two lines of input here in my input stream. So when I call this transform lines, it should have called the transforming function twice with the text of each of the two lines with the new line stripped off. Um, if you if the uh, string doesn't end, if the stream rather doesn't end with a new line, it it still calls the function twice. Um, here, I'm testing the output functionality, and since I'm mocking what the uh, the transforming function does, I have to specify the behavior of uh, any side effects that I expect to happen. So I'm saying that it should take the string argument. So this is the signature of my transforming function that transforms lines. It should take that string and it should, uh, that line, that text, and should insert it into the output stream. Uh, this do all says all of these things should happen when this mock expectation is matched. So it's going to write the string, and then it's going to return true. Up here, I didn't specify the return value, so I was just uh, letting it take the default, which is essentially 0, which is false. Because um, I didn't care about what happened to the output. I was just validating what happened to the expected uh, transforming function. Over here, I'm testing what happens to the output. So my input did not end in a new line, but I'm expecting my output should end in a new line. So the input with a new line added is what I should expect in the output. Um, here, the, this, uh, this, the bool value returned from this transforming function says whether or not a new line is written into the output by the transformer, uh, this transform lines function rather. So. Um, the first time it returns false, the second time it returns true, so we get the text without an intervening new line as the output. Uh, if we just take a look at this implementation stuff over here, so we'll get, again we'll go top down. Here's my main. I'm just checking arguments. I check um, too few or too many, and if that's the case then we uh, spit out this usage message and return zero or return non-zero rather. Um, I've got a little map that specifies the name of the command and the little function that it should use to transform the lines. That's the line transformer. I'm going to uh, take the second argument, look it up in that map, and if we didn't find it in the map then that returns an error printing out the usage message. Otherwise we have to look at whether we had an input file or an output file and I'm letting you use minus for standard in or standard out so here's the case where you specified a file uh, sorry here's the case where you either did not specify an input file 
or you did specify the input file and it was specified as minus so we're going to transform lines using uh, standard in as the input stream and standard out as the output stream if you gave us an input file name and uh, an output file name uh, here I didn't write a test for this I guess I could I here I'm assuming that if you're specifying an input and an output that the input is not dash so that's a an error here if you specified um, four arguments but it doesn't check if the third argument is a dash to use uh, standard in as the input so it opens a file from the input but the next argument was dash so it sends the output to standard out and then finally we have an input file and an output file so we're going to transform lines from the input file to the output file the little line transformer is really simple we just as long as we have input we're gonna use a get line to get a line of input into a string um, it's a little this is always a little weird with get line that you know first you check the input stream because if you couldn't open the file the input stream won't be open so we don't want to try and get line on an input stream that isn't open but then the input stream could be empty and we don't know that until we attempt we don't know that we're at end of file until we attempt to read something so we attempt to read a line of input out of the file and then if the input stream is now testing false that means we attempted to read something but we were at end of file so there wasn't actually anything read into the the string so we break out of the processing loop if that was the case otherwise we're going to call the transformer with the string and the output stream and if the transformer returned true then we're going to stick a new line into the output stream as well so that's the top level code that's driving this little thing this little example um, these two lower and two upper they're really straightforward I'm just using in this case I'm using the copy variation of the string algorithm so if I wanted to lower the string in place I would uh, in this case I don't have um, I'm using a string view so I can't uh, well, I guess you can write through a string view but at any rate the, the string view if I wanted to lower modify the string in place I wouldn't use the copy variation of the algorithm I would just use boost algorithm to lower it takes an output iterator so I am using the OStream iterator template class from the standard library to say insert characters into this stream so this template argument is the type of the things that will be inserted into the stream which in our case it's just cares we're not going to insert integers or something like that we're going to insert characters um, and we're going to get the those characters from this string view the uh, boost algorithm will copy them in and if we if we drill in with f12 and our ide here into this implementation you see here's the the implementation of two lower copy and down here you see there's another variation where um, it's taking so this is taking an output iterator and a range as input and then down and that's doing uh, delegating to transform range copy but if we just give it an input range then um, the output iterator how does it do this this is delegating to an, a different overload of transform range copy is what that is doing uh, here's the inline version that does the transform in place uh, so that requires a writable range not just a range that you can read from uh, again this code probably would be improved in terms of you know compilation diagnostics whatnot if they used concepts there the, the I mean this writable range T they're using it to um, to uh, tell you when you read the code that it is uh, supposed to be a model of a writable range but there's no concept uh, 
requirement here. So uh, if you don't supply a template argument that represents a writable range, you just get a weird compile error. But many of the string algorithms, they have a version that operates in place if it's a transforming algorithm, or they uh, have a version that uh, makes a copy. Um, sometimes the copy is a return value, and other times the copy is made through a, yeah, oh, that's probably what that other variant was of the two lower copy. Uh, yes, this is returning, I believe, a, a, a sequence as opposed to this one is returning the output iterator. Um, at any rate, the return values from these algorithms can be useful for chaining sequences of operations together. Uh, the algorithms usually operate on ranges. A range is just a pair of iterators representing the begin and end of a sequence. Um, it can be convenient to create ranges directly, which we'll see in some code the, um, when we get to break line, which is a more complicated example here. The two upper, it's the same way. So I've already got this uh, built here. Let's just double check it. Yes, it's built. And if I go over here, I've got uh, this executable already built. It's in my path. If I go up here, I got a little, uh, let's just go into the source directory. So if we look in here, there's a CMake lists. And that has mixed case. If I say stringer to upper CMake lists, it output the thing all in uppercase. If I say to lower, it converted everything to lowercase. You can see here this fatal error keyword for CMake minimum required. It got converted to lowercase. So just a simple example of using uh, string algorithms. Now, as I mentioned, there is this concept of a finder and a formatter. And if we take a look at the break line implementation, which you can see is a little bit longer, doing something meaty here. Um, at the top, this is going to take the input string, and the first thing it's going to do is called trim copy. This is a version one of the boost algorithms where the copy function returned the modified sequence. So uh, it or it. It returns a new sequence that represents the result of the transformation. So this is the trim operation. So it's trimming white space from the front and end of the string. So this is part of our requirements. Let's take a look at the tests for this. Um, you know, if we can look at the tests for the two lower. It's really straightforward. Empty string does, you know, the output is empty if the input is empty. If the string is already lowercase in the in the case of two lower, then the output is equal to the input, and if it has any uh, uppercase, it's converted to lowercase. Those tests are all really straightforward. The break line is where things get more interesting. So um, in order to build up long input lines that need to be folded, I've created a little uh, repeater helper function here. got a few little tests around that just to make sure that my repeater is doing what expected. Um, Empty lines are unchanged. Leading white space should be dropped. Trailing white space should be dropped. Horizontal white space. So um, it, 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 I didn't write any tests to see what happened if you had a vertical tab in here, but it, I believe the implementation would drop those as well. Hardly anybody types a vertical tab or a uh, form feed character anymore. That's kind of a very 70s thing to do in software because uh, you wanted your code printed out nicely on the printer when you printed out your source code. At any rate, so we're going to trim the front and back. If you want to trim just the front, there is a variant of the trim algorithm that does that. There's a trim in place. Uh, trim copy if trim right trim left 
and copy and copy if variants. So if you didn't want to just rely on the C type classification of whether something is white space, you want to supply your own predicate, you could do that with the copy ifs or the trim ifs. But for our purposes, that's fine. Um, I'm going to do some checking around whether or not the resulting line is empty. Uh, one of the requirements is that multiple blank lines are squished into a single blank line. Uh, that's what this logic is doing here. And the next thing, let's go back to our tests. So we are checking uh, white space. And then the next thing we are checking is that long lines with no white space and they contain only alphanumeric characters so we don't have some kind of punctuation that we can break on so in this case about the only thing we can do is to do the same thing that the unix fold command does which is just to insert a hard break at the column limit so my little repeat 10 guy takes each one of these characters and repeats it 10 times so this has 0 through 8 that's 90 characters uh, you know 10 zeros then 10 ones then 10 twos then and so on to get 90 characters so this has to be folded and um, my little separator that's introduced when we fold is a new line followed by four spaces I could make some of these things configurable, but for the purpose of the example, I didn't do that. My Perl script lets you specify the amount of indent and so on. But here we're just uh, going to keep that policy fixed. So we're going to break a line, and the output should be 0 through 7 repeated 10 times, followed by the separator, followed by a repeat of 8. So that squishing logic is happening down here. Uh, I'll just kind of give you an overview at the top. Um, after we check to blank line processing, we're going to squish multiple white space in the interior of a line. Then we're going to look to see if we can break at white space. If we can't break at white space, we're going to look for uh, non-alphanumeric to see if we can break at non-alphanumeric. And if we can't do that, then we're going to just break at the line length. Uh, this little pad business here is just accounting for the fact that when we break a line we're putting a new line in but then we're adding we're indenting the continued lines by four spaces so if we've broken the input we set the pad to four which is the number of spaces we're indenting so that as we continue to process this very long line each of the segments that is indented is accounted for so that we still don't go past the 80 column limit. And then if there's anything left over, then we're going to output that. And uh, there's no trailing new line because that's handled by the um, string transforming driver that we saw. So that's the top level view. If we go back and look more at these test cases, uh, so we had a test case for a long line with no white space. Um, if it's exactly hitting the column limit, it shouldn't be folded. Um, if we've got multiple interior white space, so here I'm doing this repeat 10, but some of the characters are spaces, so it's repeating 10 spaces, 10 tabs, and then here's 30 tabs, and then 2, 3, 30 more spaces, uh, and we're expecting that um, the X, Y's, and Z's are also repeated, so we're expecting that the repeat 10 of the X, the Y, and the Z joined together by spaces, that should be the expected output. And here we're using the join algorithm from uh, the string algorithms library. Uh, and I have included that header in my test code since I am directly depending on that. You should always include what you use directly. So uh, join is another very common operation that is not supported by the 
uh, either the member functions or the free functions in the standard library for std basic string. So we are joining a collection which I've just written as a std vector here and since I've uh, specified that my C++ standard as C++20 I didn't need to specify the template argument here it can be deduced. You can see my IDE is smart enough to know that that is redundant and I can drop that off. The argument of the can of the vector, the template argument of the vector is deduced through uh, what's called a, dedu a deduction template or sorry a deduction guide that's what they call it. Um, so join that stuff together that's what with a space between the elements so there's no space at the end there's just a space put between each of those repeat 10 strings uh, that's what my output should be if I um, have a string that has a bunch of numbers and then some underscores and then a parenthesis so this is not considered an identifier character so an identifier character is a letter a digit or underscore so the first part of the string is some numbers with underscores then an open paren and then some more numbers so we should expect that the algorithm will break at the paren and this uh, second part will be on the second line and this first part will be on the first line so the output will be the first line with the separator and then the second line and these test cases just go on like that so you know prefer folding at the last non alphanumeric it's just very similar except instead of digits it's letters um, if, if you don't have non alphanumeric characters to break on then you just get a hard fold at the column limit um, if we have alphanumeric and uh, spaces prefer to break on the space so my input is the first part with a space in between so prefer to break on the space prefer to break on white space um, here is a really long line that I've um, broken up into a vector of the expected chunks and I am saying take those input chunks join them with empty string so they're all abutted right against each other but the output is expected that the parts will be joined by the separator the line separator so it's a really really long line that will be um, turned into a single w string when we pass it as the input a, a single string with uh, you know no new line characters no white space characters but uh, multiple folds will be required and this is what we expect it uh, to be on the output uh, here's our test case for multiple blank lines I've used a raw string literal here because I just found it a little bit easier to read than uh, all the embedded backslash ends and so these multiple lines of multiple blank lines on the input I didn't put any whites extra trailing white space here because I thought that would be visually confusing but uh, the algorithm first trims the white space out so even if there was white space here that would be considered a blank line a line with only white space on it is considered to be a blank line those multiple blank lines get squished into a single blank line and then here's just kind of you know lorem ipsum type long text with a bunch of spaces in between and these are where we expect this vector of, of strings we expect the breaking to occur at these boundaries so we join those lines together with a space as the input and we expect that those lines will be joined together with a separator on the output. That's kind of what the test cases look like. They kind of cover all the major things. And um, 
maybe that gives you some idea about how you can test you know code that you have that you haven't have been trying to figure out how to write unit tests for let's go back look here and look at the implementation so the interesting bit I mean you saw we here we use this trim copy algorithm and this uh, squish interior white space we didn't look at here's where we are using the finders and the formatters so here's my predicate um, it's unfortunate that the definition of std is space is a function that takes an int and it returns an int it does not take a care and return a care so you always end up having to do the technically speaking you should do, be doing this static cast and the reason is because a care on some platforms might be signed whether or not a care is signed or unsigned is implementation specific so it's just kind of annoying you need to do this to make sure that this value of a character won't go in as a negative number because is space is usually implemented as a table lookup and you don't want to be using negative indices into the table so that's the first annoyance uh, the second annoyance is that it returns an int it does not return a bool so if we want a predicate that takes a care returns a bool we have to do this comparison against zero so that gives us our predicate now I've just written it as a lambda lambdas have some implementation defined type so you declare them as auto there's nothing in here that it's no it's not capturing any state into the lambda so we can just make it static that this is anonymous class that is created by the compiler will be instantiated exactly once now for the finder the finders and formatters are part of the concepts here of this library if we go down back here and look at the concept of a finder so finder takes two parameters perform a search on the interval i and j and returns the result of the search that's the model of the concept and here's their example of a simple finder were you were you to write your own finder yourself now they give you functions to create finders from other arguments so you normally don't need to do that normally don't need to write your own implementation of the finder concept the token finder constructed from this function that takes a predicate and what it does is it applies the predicate to each element in the range and if you said compress off then it stops at the first element that matches if it's enabled then adjacent matching items are concatenated into one match so you can think of this token finder as essentially something like a tokenizer in a parser that takes a sequence of input characters and turns them into a range that is considered to be a single token now in 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 our case we're trying to squish multiple white space so I've got a predicate that identifies if any individual character is a white space character and then my finder will result in a range of characters where all the characters in the range are considered to be white space my formatter I'm going to use a constant so the formatter is the thing that's going to provide a string to replace the range that was matched by the finder in my case I just want to take multiple white space whether it's spaces or tabs or whatever and replace that with a single space so my formatter is this const formatter that ignores its input argument and always returns a fixed string or fixed result so that's my finder gets a token of white space one or one or more white space characters as a as a single range and then my formatter is going to take that range and replace it with a single space and I can do that with find format all now an interesting thing that I had as a bug in my code and 
because string processing is always really fussy. Lots of little edge cases that you can get wrong. That's why I always recommend. Let's just get this back to non-edited, no star. Um, I initially just had a test case that didn't have this extra bit at the end here. So I just had a test case with a single occurrence of multiple white space characters in the middle of my string. And I wasn't using find format at all. I was just using find format. So the first one got replaced and that satisfied my test case. But when I did an integration test and ran on a, an input file, I noticed that there was additional multiple horizontal white space still present. So always a good idea to test things with a unit test and then run an integration test to make sure things work all end to end as you expect. So that was how I ended up with a, using find format all instead of just find format. Again, if we just drill in with the F12 here, uses the finder to search for a substring, uses the formatter to format this substring and replace it in the input, and then repeats this for all matching. And the input is modified in place, which is exactly what we want to do. We want to do the modification in place on this line that we've accepted by reference. And we want to look for white space multiple white space characters and replace them with a single space. So that kind of gives you a feel for finders and formatters to um, more easily deal with the ranges that I was using in my code here, this uh, boost iterator range, this comes from the boost range library, which is handy all on its own. Uh, we've done a, a talk on ranges v3. This is ranges v2. Uh, ranges v2 has no problem working with older editions of MSVC. Ranges v3 requires, a, a, I'm not exactly sure which release of uh, MSVC, but a, a more recent one from the past couple of years for it to uh, work correctly and pass all the tests. But we're using ranges v2. And we are, a range is a, essentially a pair of iterators. The type of the iterator that we're using is a std string iterator. So this little type alias here is just making my code, you know, more simp uh, more straightforward. I don't have to constantly repeat this template argument business. Um, this gets space fold. What's going on with that? Well, we're trying to find a string range to break this line on white space. So we're going to go and get a string range from this little helper function, get space fold. We're going to, this, this break range function is just a little helper that I used to extract out some duplication. If the range is not empty, and the range is smaller than the line length possibly adjusted by pad because we might be indenting then we're going <clears throat> then we're going to get a string view that represents the text covered by the range we're going to output that text to the output stream with the continuation uh, new line and new line of four spaces then we're going to modify the line to drop off the text that we just output and uh, the pivot point will either be kept or dropped depending on this enum argument. So if the pivot point is dropped, we will drop off one more character from the subs from, from the line. And if we modify the line, we return true, otherwise we return false. So we're going to look for a place to break by white space. If that was successful, then we we need to account for the fact that we've now broken the line and we need uh, to account for the indentation on the next line. We may need to break again and keep going as long as this line is too long. So first we're going to try and break on space. Then we're going to try and break on non-identifier characters, so basically punctuation. And if we couldn't break 
on either of those, then we will just put a hard break in the line and keep doing that until the last chunk of the line is small enough to fit in the output and then just output that last piece. Uh, notice that whenever we fold, the indenting white space is always added. So this last piece, if it was a result of the last piece of a big folded line, it'll have already been indented. So we didn't need to worry about that here. Okay, so these um, things that find the range to break on, this is kind of where things get a little more interesting. So similar, we're going to have a predicate that checks for the condition we're interested in. We're going to use that to create a token finder. And then we're going to find something from the string. Now, we may have found, if we go back to our test case, we had this test case here where, you know, there's multiple occurrences of white space in this string. We don't want to break on the very first one. We want to keep looking for more white space until we get to the next chunk that were we to add it to our output line that would exceed the desired length. So that's what this conditional logic is doing here. We're saying we found something, so it's not empty. This range is not empty. The size of the range is uh, smaller than the line length adjusted by the pad. We are only in here because the line is long and we need to break it. So we know that we could uh, potentially accumulate more stuff into this range. So set up our search range to start at the end of the previous range and go to the end of the line. Look for the next chunk of stuff. And if we found another chunk that was not empty, and if we add that chunk to the current range, it still fits within the line, then advance the end of, the, of our result by the size of the chunk plus one, because we want to skip to pass the, uh, we want to get one more character because of the, of, the, of the white space, the separator that is. And we're going to advance the search begin by the same amount and then we're going to look for the next chunk. Now, um, by doing this, advancing these ranges, we're avoiding rescanning characters that we've already scanned. So we are going through the, the characters in the string, you know, at most once. Uh, so we're going to repeat that. And when we uh, break out of that loop, we're going to return this uh, value down here. And according to our test cases, everything works as expected. That, most importantly, this test case here breaks at the right point. Uh, the lines are not too long, but they're also not ridiculously short. And uh, initially, when I had this, this is uh, just something, you know, this is why test-driven development helps you get things right. I didn't have this additional logic in here. Uh, to keep accumulating chunks until I got to the maximally sized range of text where I could break on white space, um, and, but there was no more that I could include uh, on the line. So it took me a while to, to, to figure that out exactly, but by practicing test-driven development, I made sure that I was uh, fixing the test case that represented the new functionality, but I wasn't breaking anything else. Just keep rerunning my tests. And if you break something, then you back out and you start over again. It took me a couple of iterations to get through that. Like I said, string processing is always very finicky. It's got a lot of edge conditions, a lot of little different things that can go wrong. So it's, it's and fortunately, it's very functional programming style code. It has an input and a, a well-defined input and a well-defined output for what each input should be. So it's easy to write. Uh, tests for this stuff. This one down here, this is a little different. Um, instead of writing the predicate in the positive sense, we are looking for a predicate in the negative sense. So we are looking for a character that is not alphanumeric. So it's not lowercase letter, uppercase letter, or a digit zero through nine. And it's also not an underscore. 
And um, the reason that I'm doing that is because if we go back and look at my little Perl script, uh, my Perl script up here, and my Perl script was looking to break on backslash capital W, which in a regex, regular expression, means a character that is not a so-called word character. Word characters are alphanumeric or underscore. So that's what this predicate is trying to say. Is the character not a word character? So again, we're going to squish those into tokens, consecutive sequences of not word characters using a finder. Now here, um, I did this a little different. Instead, I, I know that this is a line that needs to be, that's too long, that needs to be broken. So instead of doing, uh, you know, this kind of a search and always testing the size against the line length, I just start by searching a segment that is only as big as the adjusted line length, uh, line length minus any pad. So I'm searching in a substring I'm not making any copies of strings here. This is just a range of iterators. So uh, it's essentially a pair of pointers. It's not an expensive thing to create. It doesn't result in any data being copied from the string. Then I'm going to search for the breakpoint using my finder. If it was not empty, I'm going to return an adjusted string range that starts at the beginning of this segment, which is the the reduced, the trimmed, trimmed is probably a bad word, the substring that is constrained to the length that I need. And it's going to end where the find algorithm, it, the, the result range starts at the beginning of the segment and goes until the beginning of this range that was returned by find because I'm my predicate is backwards so the desired end is the beginning of the result that came from find uh, and because my predicate is specified in the negative and I trimmed this line to be only searching in the substring that is relevant I don't need to do that while loop I tried changing this code up here to do something similar, you know, search in a segment and so to avoid the, the while loop and, and, and change my predicate. I, I broke a bunch of tests and I wasn't sure exactly why it was breaking, so I, I just reverted it. Um, that's the nice thing about having everything covered by tests is I can try a refactoring and if I get it wrong, I can just revert the change, go back, everything's green, I didn't break anything. So this one's a little bit simpler, although this string range construction here is a little, it looks a little odd at first glance, but the tests prove that it it, it does the right thing. Uh, and that's the entirety of this algorithm. We are trimming the input, uh, looking for uh, empty lines. This little, I have a little global here. Uh, we didn't talk about the empty line processing, but this little global starts off at false. Uh, we check to see if the trimmed line so the white space has already been trimmed from the front and the end. So if there was a line consisting of only white space, all the white space has been trimmed and the line is empty. So if it was empty and the last line was empty, then we don't need to do anything except return false to tell the transformer that it shouldn't output a new line because we're going to squish multiple blank lines. So the current line is empty and the last line was empty. Don't emit a new line. Otherwise, remember that what it, you know now the current line is going to be the last line the next time we come in here. So the last line is empty gets that empty flag. Going to squish any remaining interior space from that line. If the line is long, too long, exceeding our column length, we're going to look to fold it white space. And if we did, then remember the the pad value and continue. To, to process the remaining chunks of this line. Otherwise, look to break at non-identifier characters and continue there. 
And if we couldn't do any better, then we'll just do a hard break at the column length. And that is everything. So let's take a look at it running here. So as I said, I created this Perl script 30 years ago because you often have output from make that looks like this. This is happens to be the output from make building the portable network graphics image library on Linux. And, you know, reading this stuff is really quite noisy and I've got my window extended. You can see some of these lines are really long. So if I say stringer break line make that log pipe that into more now everything is folded at a reason in a reasonable way and more importantly you can see that I mean this make file it's invoking bash to run a script called lib tool and it's passing that lib tool script a bunch of arguments uh, and then down here the make file had a f had a line that was continued so that th this line down here it's not indented because this is on a separate physical line in the input stream um, this little backslash got it continued f onto the same logical line as it was executing commands inside make but we can see we start to see patterns now in this output that you know these dash g dash o2 dash mt dash go2 mt go2 mt this is repeated every time it's going to compile a c file and we can kind of start to see the patterns in that file now if we look at this original again we see that it contained multiple white space inside each of these lines that's just taking up extra room on my terminal not providing any value it's not justifying its existence and because my scroll window is larger than um, you know my visual width here I've got stuff going off to the side so if I want to see this other stuff I have to have to use this scroll bar whereas if I run it through my little break line guy I can see these are the lines that are logically broken to continue this one physical input line the indentation tells me that uh, the unhelpful repeated horizontal white space has been squished out to single spaces um, this particular build is not elaborately complicated but particularly with a um, CMake build where you have code that depends on many libraries and each library adds an additional dash i directive onto the command line and it may add additional dash d directives uh, onto the command line it's easy for these command lines to get to be thousands of characters long so uh, breaking them up so that you can uh, read them this way is really quite useful and what ends up happening is for those really really long command lines all the dash i's and the dash d's tend to end up in the same place but because the horizontal white space has been minimi minimized and folded lines are indented what you see is paragraphs of commands scrolling by on your screen and because they're all formatted consistently they all have the same um, visual layout and you can start to see the part that's changing and it's usually the only part that's changing is the name of the source file that it's compiling or the name of the output file that it's going to write to and uh, monitoring a very noisy build becomes actually something that you, you can engage your visual cortex with and you can start to see the patterns and you can see what's different and then you start noticing which files are actually compiled differently from the other ones whereas if you tried to figure that out just from looking at the raw log it, it, you'd go crazy so I didn't go over every algorithm in the string algorithms library most of them the reason these uh, header files end up being lengthy is because they have many variants. So there's going to be a copy variant, and an if variant, a copy if variant, and so on. Um, however, the algorithms are, for, are fairly straightforward. And 
the uh, one thing I haven't mentioned about these algorithms is that um, they have I, I didn't show it in my little example but one thing that's annoying is if you try to do a case insensitive compare operation you have to, you end up writing uh, code that uh, does like a transform operation where the transform operation calls to upper from C type on a character to get the uppercase version of the character or you call to lower to get the lowercase version so you take the entire string and you essentially lower it before you compare them or you upper it before you compare them so the string algorithms here uh, let's see find replace predicates classification case conversion so they have algorithms to uh, convert I thought there was a section on compare I guess it's just the header so um, they have algorithms that do case insensitive compare so instead of having to write your own little transformer and what like uh, they just essentially do uh, a string comparison where instead of transforming the string and then comparing it it compares the characters in a case insensitive way now you might be saying to yourself that's all fine and dandy if you're ASCII but what about uh, non ASCII character sets you know other locales that have different sort orders different comparison orders and so on all the functions where locales are relevant take a locale argument so you can specify the locale that's to be used for the comparison or the sorting operation so it's locale aware now there were some questions about whether or not these algorithms are Unicode aware now in Windows Unicode usually means WKRT and these algorithms are all templated on the character type so they're not only provided for care they would also work for WKRT and as long as you had a suitable locale that knew how to do uh, comparison and sorting operations on WKRTs you'd be perfectly fine what's missing is UTF-8 and uh, over here on the website for the boost book oh, that's not the one it's this one down here at the bottom of this chapter there's a question it's like you know can this library handle Unicode strings and the author says no but I'm gonna say no with an asterisk the person asking the question did not specify what character encoding they were using for their Unicode strings now typically when people ask that question they're asking it from a Linux perspective and what they mean is UTF-8 he didn't specify he didn't specify Windows or Linux, and he didn't specify what character encoding, whether it was UTF-8 or uh, WKRT or uh, the 32-bit character code. I believe these algorithms would work perfectly fine as long as you're using the fixed-length character codes of either WKRT or the 32-bit character code for the full-blown 32-bit. Um, Unicode code points it does not I don't I don't believe it would work correctly for UTF-8 it doesn't understand that multiple bytes in the UTF-8 input represent a single code point so little asterisk there otherwise uh, he's recommending that if you need to do Unicode stuff that you look at the boost locale library there's also a giant Unicode library from outside of boost but that's a topic for another day so that gives you a um, brief introduction to boost string algorithms uh, we didn't talk about the fact we just mentioned it if we look over here in our build folder include boost algorithm all these other algorithms also get supplied to you not just the string algorithms so there's other algorithms you may find useful um, particularly this is palindrome predicate could be useful in some string processing I don't you know in case you need to know if a string is a palindrome a palindrome is a string that is written the same forward and backwards it's it's general the algorithm is generalized to arbitrary sequences of elements not just characters but um, 
there you go easy to consume easy to use the only part I ran into trouble with was when I was writing was writing some of this code that was calling these algorithms and manipulating ranges um, I'll be honest I'm familiar intellectually with ranges but because my work we are restricted to 11 C++ 11 or 14 and we don't use boost so I don't have a lot of day-to-day -day experience with ranges so little thing just little tiny things like I didn't realize you could call size on a range and it would tell you the number of elements that is spanning the beginning and end iterators that that's a very handy thing here in my string processing so I didn't I was doing something a little weird at first until I thought you know hey maybe they just have a size member on this uh, iterator range and sure enough they did so I think it's pretty straightforward using this library like I said they could do with some more examples um, I understand that writing all those examples is like a lot of boilerplate and it's pretty tedious and repetitive which is probably why they only wrote a few but it's always helpful to have more examples than fewer even if you're you know generating them from like a Python script to, to generate the boilerplate of the examples I think that would still be helpful but that's just me uh, all this code will be uploaded to github so you can play with it and see how it works and that's about it unless we have any questions Okay, I am going to end it there.